Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. How prevalent is sexual violence in areas where violence is raging, many in war zones? What can be done to help people who are caught in harm's way? My guest today is an expert on these issues. My guest today is uh, Ms. Zainab Hawa Bangura. Ms. Bangura of Sierra Leone is the United Nations Special Representative of the Secretary General on Sexual Violence and Conflict. Ms. Bangura, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you very much. I appreciate you being back. We did this show about five years ago when you were just starting on your mission, and it'll be great to get an update on what has happened. Let's talk a little bit about your role as Special Representative of the Secretary General on Sexual Violence. Uh, when was this formed and why was it formed? Um, the office actually mm -hmm. was um, established through Security Council Resolution 1888 under the United States Presidency in the former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. It was created to provide coherent and strategic leadership on sexual violence in conflicts around the world. So basically this high level person who is at the level of Under Secretary General is supposed to be the face and the voice. And the creation of the office came after the aftermath of series of gang rapes that took place in the DRC. So when Secretary of State Hillary visited, she was shocked to hear how hundreds and hundreds of women were raped within a day by a series of um, soldiers, the DRC government soldiers. So she came in and then decided that this office should be set up, and that's how it was created. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get into that. You mentioned the Democratic Republic of Congo and women who were raped, and that has, in many cases, become a practice of war. Unfortunately, it's a tactic of A tool of, of war, war and a tactic uh, of uh, war. Exactly, and we'll get into that in just a moment. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, your priorities. How There are so many hot spots around the world, the Democratic Republic of Congo, South Sudan, we could go Syria, Iraq. How do you prioritize these countries? You, you don't have a staff of thousands that can go out and do the good work, but how do you prioritize and identify where you're going to try to intercede and to provide assistance? I am the chair of what's called United Nations Action Against Sexual Violence, which brings 13 entities around the world, DPQ, OCHA, UNICEF, UNFP, so all of the UN agencies who are working on gender-based violence, who are in the field, who have staff, they are part of parcel of the team that actually directs us. We follow the stories, we follow the pain. So once we get the information that this thing is happening, especially countries that are in the Security Council agenda, so we actually send a team and we collect information. Once we have the various criteria, it's systematic, how many times it's taken, how many number of victims and so on, and then we decide to be able to put it on our list. That's mm -hmm. So we follow the story. Exactly. Where the, the incidents are taking place. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, that's so important to bring together. You mentioned the UN, UN Population Fund, the UN Children's Fund, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, uh, peacekeeping just on across the board, because these are all key players. That and they are on the ground. They are very the big. Ground. They are very big in the, in, in, in the ground. So we walk through them. They are the people who actually lead us mm -hmm. to where the problems are. So we provide, as I said, we provide a coherence and strategic leadership. For example, in the case of Syria, the first person that actually alighted, alighted me was Baroness Amos. She was the one who invited me to her office, the former head of OCHA, the Office of Humanitarian Coordination. And she said, you know, I'm picking up this information that there are problems happening with sexual violence, women being raped, whether in prison, mm -hmm. in the house-to-house -house searches, in the border crossing, at detention facility. So once she raised it, we send the messages out to all the colleagues, and then the information started coming in. And so that's how Syria was <coughs> designated and was put on, the, on our list of countries that are committing these crimes. Mm -hmm. How do you uh, intervene with these? Do you work with these UN agencies to determine their strategy to intervene? How do, how do they interact? For, let's say, take for example, Iraq is a very problematic area. And uh, say a young woman there who is caught in a, in a violent area and this uh, tactic of war, she is raped in the process. How do you intervene to help her uh, let's say to deal with being uh, not being ostracized by her family or her community, uh, not having psychological problems, uh, having physical problems, uh, things like that. Are, are there some are there some types of assistance that can be brought to bear to help her? We intervene at different <coughs> level, depend <coughs> on the circumstances. 
we, most of the time we try to intervene directly, work with the government to sign an agreement with them, a joint communicate to address the issue. The first challenge you have is how you break the culture of silence because mm -hmm. there's a lot of denial and culture of silence behind sexual violence. When you confront the government and other people say, oh, no, no, we're not committing, it's not happening here. And that way, because most of the victims of sexual, like you mentioned, uh, because of the stigma associated with it, they are very, very reluctant. So sometimes you get the information from organizations like MSF, because this that's where the women go first. Mm -hmm. To, to explain and we try to raise the awareness for support for MSF. We work with the judiciary, we work with the military. In most peacekeeping um, situation, we actually train the military to be able for early warning to detect. Because once you train them, they know, for example, when women go to fetch firewood. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the military patrol and they realize the women have stopped. They've stopped going to get firewood. They've stopped going to get water. They'd rather stay in the camps. So the, once the military has been trained, then they detect something is happening, something is preventing this woman going out. Then they, they will realize, and then they start escorting the women to prevent sexual violence. So it, the, the intervention varies, because the most important thing is for provi to provide the support to the victims so that they can be dealt with, mm -hmm. um, medical, psychosocial, and legal. But more important is to make sure the people who commit the crime are tried. Mm -hmm. you know, in the country. So we work a lot with the justice system in the country to ensure, for example, DRC, which you mentioned, within a period of one year, we're able to make sure that 100 and over 150 military officers were actually investigated and prosecuted, including a general. So you work on the law. In some cases, they don't have the legal framework. So we work on them. In some cases, like Guinea, Conakry, mm -hmm. where 109 women were raping a day. We worked with the judges to train them to be familiar with international law so that whatever they are doing is within the framework of international law. So each country is different, it's unique, but we pay attention first to the women victim. We, we try to have a victim-centered approach. A lot of the time we work with the UN agencies to develop a comprehensive strategy so that the UN on the ground can actually pay attention. We raise funds for the UN entities. For example, in DRC, I was able to go to Japan a raise fund for UNICEF, UNFPA, UN Women, so they could do their job on the ground. So their approaches are different, depending mm -hmm. on the circumstances and what it entails. Mm -hmm. Do you have a ballpark figure? I know there are areas, uh, well, various conflicts that pop up periodically, but are, do you have a ballpark figure of how many countries or how many areas of the world that are having this problem right now? It, and I, I realize it varies from country to country, and not all, well, all countries are like, but all countries are different as you look at them. But do you have a ballpark idea of the number? Last, in the reports of last year, we actually listed 19 countries around mm -hmm. the world, the entire globe. And it's countries in conflict, Countries that are out of conflict, because we've realized that the security sector of reform has a relationship with sexual violence. We also deal with countries in political turmoil. For example, we did once in Kenya, in Guinea, I mentioned too, quite recently in Burundi, because during the, 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 the challenge after the election, the aftermath of the election, when um, the military started attacking the opposition, we realized that a lot of women were raped just because they belonged to the wrong tribe. So we look at three categories of countries, but at the moment in time, we're dealing with 19 countries, 45 parties that we've listed in the annex of the Secretary General. Seven of these countries are, you know, you have terrorists. And so we're dealing with Al Shabaab, Al Qaeda, mm -hmm. you know, um, no, Nostra, all of those countries were working in this. So it's 19 countries. 45 mm -hmm. parties, but five parties, five countries where the military or the police or the intelligence are also part of the problem. They're also committing sexual violence and mm -hmm. conflicts. Years ago, we used to hear the term list of shame, and uh, some, some groups and some organizations still use that. They use the list of shame, and if a country is on there, can it graduate to get off? Obviously, if it improves and does better and deals with the problem, then it can, but uh, do you have that list of shame? We have that list. That's that's in the list. It's part of the annex, mm -hmm. and oh, the this annex. list was okay. one of the is one of the elements of compliance. Mm -hmm. So we have this list where we have 45, I think 45, 49 parties to the conflict. You know, you should see my office in March when the list comes out. All of these countries coming and say, "Get me out of the list." Get me, you know, and that's a period of negotiation. Mm -hmm. Because he's saying that you want to get out of the list, let's do things. <laughs> the interesting experience I had two years ago was I went to Syria 
and I went to the office of the special envoy, and then he said, I have a complaint from one of the, the groups, the Islamist group, that said, okay, that you put them on the list. They don't belong to the list. They're not supposed to be the list. And I said to myself, I said, that's very interesting. So if they don't want to be the list, then let them do something that will get, get off, off the list. Mm -hmm. Now we're working for the first time with the military in Cote d'Ivoire to actually get them on the list because we have criteria. And being in the list is also important for us because in a recent resolution in the Security Council, is they decided that if you are on our list, you cannot qualify to be a peacekeeper. So the countries really? that are in the list are fighting to get out of the <laughs> list because they want to go into peacekeeping. Also, any, any indication that a country goes to the list brings the country much nearer to us to negotiate with us what they need to do. You know, most recently we, we just had an agreement with, with Iraq with the foreign minister of Iraq during the General Assembly. And I'm actually visiting Iraq uh, end of February to sit with them and see what is it that we can do to support them in the area of accountability of the crimes that have been committed during the crisis in Iraq. Mm -hmm. So the list is very good because you can use this as a tool to bargain. Exactly. You use it as a tool to bargain, to get the government to say, you don't have the right laws in place. You need to change your legal system. You know, your military are not comporting themselves. Your police are not, do not know how to investigate crimes of sexual violence. So it, all, it varies. So, but we use it actually to help and support government to take the necessary action that needed to be taken to, be, to address these issues on the ground where the crimes are being committed. Mm -hmm. And it's very important because so many of these countries want to get off that list. Oh, it's yes. very, it's not prestigious oh, to be on a <laughs> no. list of shame, that's no, for sure. No. So that's, no. And they have the power to be on it or to be off of it. Exactly. And that's exactly what you explained to them. Yes. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We would invite our viewers to go to our website at www globalconnectionstelevision.com and tap into some of our previous shows. Also, if you're involved with any type of media outlet, be it a PBS or community access television station, or perhaps it's an educational institution with an intra-campus television hookup, or you just have a website and you're interested in our programs, please feel free to download them. Global Connections Television is provided free of charge at no cost to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. It does not matter where we live, we will be impacted by them, if not today, then certainly tomorrow. Today we're taking a look at the use of uh, really sexual violence in areas of violence, and my, expert is, my guest today is an expert on this topic. My guest today is Ms. Zainab Hawa Bangura of Sierra Leone, who is the United Nations Special Representative of the Secretary General on Sexual Violence in Conflict. Ms. Bangura, we're talking about the list of shame, we're talking about how countries can get off of this, and it really is important. I, uh, so, so often we hear people say, well, the UN can't go in and force a government to do something in many cases, and that's very true. The UN is not a super a national organization. It's not a one government type of, type of operation. It has to use peer pressure, and it has to use things like the list of shame. But those things can really be extremely beneficial in helping to motivate a country to to do the right thing and to try to correct some of the problems within their borders, and so that's very important. Yeah, I, I noticed that uh, you've we were talking we've talked about a few of these things as we go through, but uh, there are some items I was curious about. Uh, you've talked about already how you work with judges and you work with the court system and you work with the health providers and things like that. But uh, if we could, one thing that's extremely important is to try to get a handle on a problem before it actually happens. And we've heard about early warning indicators. Do you, do you, I know it's difficult to predict a conflict in some cases, but as you see situations developing, tempers flaring, really uh, problems simmering and that type of thing, or maybe not simmering, maybe exploding. Do you have an, or, uh, any idea of how to develop an early warning system to give you sort of a, a lead or a heads up or a, a head start on dealing with these problems? We, we, we do it, but we do it mostly with the peacekeepers mm -hmm. because um, what we have done is actually have a very good relationship with DPQ and we train most of their, their troops before they go on the ground. And even when they go out, we have the tools to train them to detect. Because mm -hmm. as I said earlier on, the issue of sexual violence is a crime that is done in privacy. Mm -hmm. The onus then remains on the victim to be able to 
either tell or the crime took place or not. So that's why perpetrators work scot-free. And so if you don't understand and know the psychic and the challenges of it, like I mentioned earlier on when I said in Darfur, we got a lot of those problems in Darfur. We even got those problems in South Sudan when mm -hmm. women were, were getting out of the protection area, they were being raped. It's difficult to tell until you have been trained to detect psychological, then you'll be able to know how to deal with it, to know to prevent it, and when the circumstances arise. So we work a lot with the military, especially mm -hmm. with our own UN military. Mm -hmm. And as far as training, uh, that's, that's very critical. Do you also work with, within a country, say, with uh, social workers, with healthcare providers, with uh, people who can provide assistance to uh, for psychological counseling and that type those, of thing to those, do training? Those kind of training actually done mostly by the UN agencies. That's why in the, in the UN Action Against Sexual Violence, we have, we have UNICEF, we have mm -hmm. UNFP, we have WHO, you know, we have DPQ, we have um, a lot of agencies, UN AIDS, mm -hmm. they're all there, it's about 13 entities. And those, each of those entities have their role. There are some who actually collect information, who give us information, say this is happening. We work with the medical, because sometimes the people who know when it's happening are the medical people. Because when these crimes happen and women go to MSA, for example, so they witness this, oh my God, it's one person, two person, three. Straight away they pick up, they say it's happening somewhere where you don't know. And so they are able to alert us. And once we know that, we go out and find out the particular area, what needs to be done, what services are to be produced, how you engage the government, how do you stop it. So we work as a team. And I think that has been extremely beneficial for us to have a very good relationship with NGOs, because we also have a NGO working group on women, peace, and security here. In the, and they have membership, affiliation, association across. We work a lot with uh, Human Rights Watch. We work a lot with Amnesty International. So all of these NGOs who are documenting mm -hmm. atrocities in conflict countries, we work with them, because they raise the alarm, and they raise the alerts. And then we, we just try to deal with the UN entity and tell them this is happening. So man try to identify what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And you've mentioned uh, peacekeeping several times. Of course, now the UN does not have a standing army, but it has about 112,000 troops and police officers who are on loan from mostly African countries, but many countries around the world do provide peacekeeping troops, and they're operating in 16 peacekeeping missions right now. How do you interact with them? Do you do you help or do you have training with them? I know that DP, the DP Department of Peacekeeping Operations has training. We work has very training, closely with the Department of DPQ. We contribute to the training material whether in books or video. Mm -hmm. So we work very closely. And when we go in mi on mission, visit countries, we also work with the mission on the ground. We engage the military. And sometimes they give us a lot of presentation because in most countries when I arrive, one of the first people that actually gives me, makes a presentation to me at the military. So they mm -hmm. give us their own experience, some of the challenges they see. And some places you go, it's very difficult to visit without the military cannot visit. So we work mm -hmm. very well with the um, peacekeeping mission each of the missions, as well as the, D the DPA mission, because not all countries have peacekeeping mission, where you have political mission, work with the leadership of the mission. So we work across the board. We work very closely. For example, um, about in November, we had a training of military leadership of six or seven of the countries we work in. You know, DRC. we had the training in, in, in Cote d'Ivoire. Mm -hmm. We actually brought in NATO the designated um, office for NATO, which is the Nordic Center, to come and share their own experiences, what are the things that they have done. We brought in the AU. So we brought in military from Mali, from Somalia, from DRC, from South Sudan, from Cote d'Ivoire. These are generals. And we sat with them to say, what is it that we can do within the military to reduce sexual violence? We wanted to develop guidelines. Because we've done a lot of experience, a lot of work in one or two countries, mm -hmm. we thought it's going to be difficult for us to multiply those training. So the best thing is to bring all of the military leadership together. So the ones where we have not worked, we learn from the ones that they have. You know, the South-South Corporation, we believe in that. Because mm -hmm. military are much more comfortable in talking to military. You know, as a civilian, you talk to them, they look at you and say, what is this woman talking to <laughs> us? But they're much more, so that's why we also work with NATO. Because we've done a lot of work with NATO. We visit them several times, you know, in, 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 in Brussels as well as here in Norfolk. So work very well when we actually work with them to develop their own material 
on gender-based violence mm -hmm. and gave them the, the support and ideas of the experience because NATO is shifting most of its work into capacity building mm -hmm. with other militaries. So they're using some of the materials we are develop and our own capacity and institution and memory to actually help them so that when they go into countries, they know exactly what to do in terms of the training. And you hit a, a very important point a minute ago about people who feel comfortable talking to pe other people, their yes. peers or whatever. You have a group called Women Protection Advisors. What exactly is the role of that group? Well, the Women Protection Advisors are the group who in the country brings everybody together. Because mm -hmm. like I said, everybody is doing something on sexual violence. So they are the people who brings everybody to be able to collect the information. You know, on an annual basis, we collect information and prepare the reports for the Secretary General, which we call the Secretary General's Annual Report on Sexual Violence. So the Women Protection Advisors are the ones who actually collect, who brings everybody around the table, who identify the problems, who follow up when I visit. Because sometimes I visit, I go to a country like South Sudan, and the president has agreed, okay, I'm going to appoint a special person in my office who is dealing with this. So women Protection has to follow and then brings all the stakeholders in the country, the Minister of Justice, the military, the police, the Minister of Education, the Minister mm -hmm. of Health, you know, to be able, they each have a role. When I went to DRC about maybe two or three months ago, I discovered that the PEP kids, these are the kids that used to test women who have been raped for HIV and this. Mm -hmm. They stopped at the, the regional headquarters and they never went back. So we had to sit to the Ministry of, of Health and say, no, you need to push these kids to be distributed to the lowest village. So every ministry has a responsibility. So the Women Protection Rights bring the UN entities around the table, the government entities around the table, and bring both parties around the table and get the information, send the information to us, and let us know what's happened. And follow up when I leave. Follow up is absolutely critical. That is so very important. And that it, you have to do that or oh, yes. all, it'll all be for naught. It's continuous. It'll, the it'll challenge resolve. about the job is that it's constant, it's continuous all mm -hmm. the time. You know, because as you get your eye off the ball, then you hear some mass, mass rape has taken place. And so you need to put them under pressure, to hold them accountable, to let them know that this is against international law, it's a war crime, and it could be a crime against humanity. So these are the challenges. So you have to keep reminding them, you have to keep supporting them, you have to keep working with them, and you have to keep encouraging them. Exactly, yes. Well, in the last minute or so we have left, the hardest question, what is the major challenge you have in completing your mission? I know funding is always a problem, but I'm sure there's, uh, there's another challenge beyond that. What, what is your major challenge I in reaching out? It's access and data. <coughs> For every one information you get, you don't get 20. Mm -hmm. it's people are very reluctant because they are ashamed because of the stigma. The accessibility, if you take the case of Iraq, most of the women we're working with actually were under ISIS control area. So until they come out before we get information, before we provide the necessary support, we still cannot account for over 3,000 Yazidi girls. So the security is a big problem for us because we cannot go into areas where you don't have support and protection. So we have a lot of women behind. And then the data, because people are very reluctant to talk because of the stigma associated. So yes, we have resources challenge, but I have mm -hmm. to say the member states have responded tremendously. They've really done as much as they can to be able to provide resources resources we need. It's not mm -hmm. enough, but it's quite a lot. We've, mo we've moved a long way the last mm -hmm. six years. I mean, it's unbelievable what we've been able to achieve. But our two biggest problems, if you ask me, is access, is data, mm -hmm. knowing how many women have been raped and responding and supporting them. And then the security. If you can't go there, if it's not safe, you can't go there. So we still have a lot of women we cannot provide support who really need our services and our voice and to be able to make sure that we can get them over. In our last 30 seconds, how important is it for the media to cover this and to focus attention on these problems and to spread the word, to let people know? The best example I can give is the Yazidi. From the first time the media pinpoints and identify that this is a big problem, mm -hmm. it has moved mm -hmm. so fast. Today, as I'm talking to you, um, the UK government is trying to put a resolution on accountability and so much information has been generated mm -hmm. we've been able to save over 1,000 Yazidis and in Germany I even went to visit them after I saw them in Iraq and Canada has provided a quota for Yazidis so it's highlighted the challenges this unique group faces and how much they have suffered so the media we cannot work without the media there's no way 
Exactly. They're absolutely pitiful. Uh, pitiful at times, but they're absolutely critical in yeah, doing very this. Very critical. But and they, they have in, been great. In, many, in some cases, they don't cover it. In, in some cases, they have. And that's what, the, what they should be doing full time. But, but uh, Ms. Bangura, I want to thank you so very much for bringing us up to date on this very important topic and some of the challenges that you're encountering and why it is so important for us to learn more about these problems and to pitch in, lend a hand whenever we can. But I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Thank you so much for being a champion. <laughs> thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.